My name is Pierre Atlas. I serve as director of the Richard G. Luger Franciscan Center for Global Studies. I'm a political science professor here at Marion University. Uh, the Global Studies program uh, consists of two components. One is the speaker series, of which you are all familiar. And uh, we have two more events next semester uh, scheduled. And hopefully you'll pick up, or if you haven't already picked up, our, our uh, brochure for next, uh, for next semester. This is for the 2016-17 academic year. This is our 14th year of the speaker series. And um, uh, we have two more events coming up, one in January with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra, and one in March. Uh, we will be hosting the uh, Indianapolis debut screening of an interfaith film called The Sultan and the Saint. Uh, and and uh, information on these are, are available on our website. In addition to the speaker series, uh, we offer an academic program in global studies. We have a minor in global studies that is designed to fit with any major at Marion University in the arts and sciences or the professional studies. And we have uh, Luger Fellow scholarships for students minoring in global studies, majoring in just about everything. And in fact, uh, just, uh, just now, uh, we had a meeting upstairs with uh, Luger Fellow students and other, and other uh, global studies students at Marion with, uh, with Senator Luger. And uh, the students, again, major in everything. Right, right now, our most popular major in the Luger Fellow program is actually biology pre-med. And so these are all students who believe that uh, having a global studies minor, having the extra language uh, requirement, having the required study abroad experience, having the special courses in global studies makes a value added package um, for their major regardless of what it is. And it's a very exciting program and if anybody is interested in finding out about it um, or if you have children or grandchildren interested in, in Marion, I'd be happy to talk to you about that afterwards. Um, I wanted to uh, bring to your attention just something that, uh, that happened and I want to, um, a, a few days ago, uh, there's a, a mosque uh, down the street um, it's our, our neighbor, Masjid El Fajr, and the um, School of Knowledge. Um, and Marion University actually has some students here who graduated from the School of Knowledge, it's the Muslim school down the street. Um, they received a very uh, horrific, threatening letter, um, along with some other, along with some other mosques um, in the United States that were that, that received this. And I just wanted to let you know. I think we have some people from the audience here um, from from the mosque. In fact, and and a Dr. Uh, Iyas Radad, are are you here? Yes, um, and uh, who is the director of the of the uh, Muslim Association for the Masjid Al Fajr? And I just wanted to let uh, let you know and and your community know that you're welcome here, and you're safe here. Um, and I and I'm very sorry about what happened. Um, Senator Luger, Richard G. Luger, has always been a voice of reason and moderation and tolerance. And um, I think that uh, we need his words here tonight and wisdom tonight more than ever. Uh, many of the young students in the audience in particular might not know very much about Senator Luger who uh, left, left the Senate after the 2012 elections. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about him before um, uh, I, I pass the mic on, over to him. Richard Luger is a fifth generation Hoosier and was the longest serving US Senator in Indiana history. He served for 36 years. Dick Luger was an Eagle Scout, a Rhodes Scholar, and a Naval Officer before entering politics. One of the nation's most respected voices on international affairs, he served as both chair and ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and also served on the Agriculture Committee. In 1996, he ran for the Republican nomination for President of the United States. Throughout his life, Dick Luger has been a man of moral courage. As a young member of the Indianapolis School Board in the 1960s, he was a strong voice for desegregation and created the IPS school lunch program. As the first term mayor of Indianapolis in 1968, he played a critical role in keeping the city calm in the days following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. as most other cities in the United States erupted into rioting. That day, uh, Indianapolis is famous because Bobby Kennedy happened to be here on the day that Martin Luther King was assassinated, which also happened to be Dick Luger's birthday. And he was, he'd only been pre uh, mayor for a couple of months. Um, and of course, uh, Bobby Kennedy's words um, were very powerful, and probably a lot of you are familiar with it. But what may, we, a lot of you may not know is that uh, Dick Luger, as mayor, went on television that night um, and gave a very calming address as well, and ordered the police to, take, uh, to deploy in certain ways that would actually calm the city and make people feel comfortable. Um, and, there, and this is one of the few cities in the entire country in 1968 that did not erupt into rioting when Martin Luther King was assassinated. And Dick Luger shares some of the credit for that. As a first term mayor of Indianapolis, um, he, uh, he also, um, as mayor of Indianapolis, he also created UNIGOV. He was talking about that with our students up, upstairs uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, basically, which turned Indianapolis into one of the major cities in the United States by combining what we have now, Marion County, as well as the city of Indianapolis. And again, a lot of younger people just sort of take that for granted, but this was actually something that was created um, by Dick Luger. Uh, 
A strong supporter of sanctions against apartheid South Africa in the 1980s, Senator Luger bravely challenged President Ronald Reagan and others within his own Republican Party and led the Senate in overriding Reagan's veto of the South Africa sanctions bill. Along with former Senator, former Democratic Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia, Luger has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for the Nunn-Luger Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, which facilitated the nuclear disarmament of four former Soviet republics and has also dismantled almost 8,000 nuclear warheads uh, under, in the possession of Russia, many of which were aimed at the United States, including the city of Indianapolis. After leaving the Senate in 2012, he became the president of the Luger Center in Washington, D.C., a nonprofit organization focusing on nuclear nonproliferation, food security, and other critical issues. Dick Luger has been, a long, has been long committed to our Marion University students and to the Global Studies program, meeting with Luger fellows and other students prior to his annual public address, as he did tonight. And when I take students to Washington, D.C. for our week-long Luger Fellow Spring Break program, which I'm going to do again in March, one of our first stops is the Luger Center for an exclusive conversation with Indiana's elder statesman. Dick and his wife, Charlene, have been married for over 50 years, and they have four children and 13 grandchildren. It is truly my honor to introduce Senator Richard G. Luger. Well, thank you very much, Pierre. You are such a generous introducer and a distinguished scholar from my great respect. I just love his pieces in the paper every month. I read them carefully to see what's on his mind and what's occurring here at this great university. And it's wonderful to see President Dan Ellsner here, who has uh, brought real momentum, dynamism to Marion University. So exciting. Uh, to be in this building, for that matter, and to see all of the surroundings as we come up this evening. And I'm so grateful to each one of you for taking a few moments on a Sunday night uh, to think about America's role in the world with me. I will not explore every aspect of that. That's a multi-chapter situation. But I do want to say, to begin with, uh, that uh, we are grateful as Americans that after World War II, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was formed. Uh, I, I mention that specifically because annually uh, European statesmen come to Washington to celebrate whatever the anniversary is of NATO, and they point out to me every time that I've got to understand, and Americans must understand, that prior to NATO, uh, there were wars among American or other European states almost every year for a thousand years. That it's really only been in the last 50 years or so that the European states joined together in a union politically and economically and have been able at least to get along with each other sufficiently that uh, they argued in councils and not with arms. Uh, when they argued with arms in World Wars I and II, the United States, uh, given our politics at the time, stood aside for quite a long while on both occasions, eventually came into those wars on behalf of certain allies. But uh, NATO brought the United States and Canada together with the European states in the North Atlantic aspect of the Treaty Alliance. So it's a very important development. Now, the difficulties, of course, are that uh, uh, NATO is uh, not unanimously uh, agreed upon by everybody on the continent. Uh, we'll not go through the history of the Soviet Union and Russia and so forth. But uh, to say the least, if you were in the Baltic states tonight, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, uh, you would have a certain degree of fear that something might happen to your country as has happened to the eastern part of Ukraine, for example. A lot of Russian-speaking people along those border areas, as there are in the eastern part of Ukraine. A lot of people who uh, might welcome a certain degree of Russian participation uh, that Vladimir Putin might take advantage of. Leaving aside the Baltics, uh, Poland, uh, to some extent, Hungary and Romania remain uh, very wary. So as a result, um, 
all of the countries in the NATO alliance have come to the United States very specifically and said, we hope that you still believe in Article 5. Article 5 is the article that says, if any one of the alliance is attacked by an outsider, every other state in the alliance will come to the rescue. That means just what it says. If Poland is attacked, the United States is pledged under the NATO alliance to come to the benefit of the defense of Poland or Lithuania or whatever else it is. And uh, that has made the NATO alliance especially powerful and specific. It's a, a situation in which um, not only the Russians are a problem, as some NATO alliance people see it, but there are, of course, within European states problems politically that are very familiar to most of us here after our election campaign in the United States. Uh, a, a good number of Europeans feel overwhelmed by the number of people coming from Syria and for that matter still coming from Iraq and various other parts of the Middle East who have been displaced by warfare. Uh, the Germans under Angela Merkel have volunteered to accept over a million people from Syria. Uh, a, a huge number of people coming into the country in a fairly short period of time. Other European nations have been more reticent. To, all have been somewhat uh, in difficulty because of this. And furthermore, um, many people in Europe, as in the United States, are very fearful of free trade treaties very fearful of free trade of any sort, for that matter, that now comes about. They are, uh, are fearful that somehow or other somebody is going to undersell them, going to take away their jobs, going to create problems for the middle class or the less educated uh, uh, of the country, uh, problems very much like ones we have heard about debated in this country. Sometimes in Europe it's called populism. And uh, we're all learning about what are the new parties of the, the center left or the center right or the far left or the far right or what have you. Uh, not really clear how all these elections are going to come out. Now, on top of that, of course, came the election or the referendum in Great Britain, the so-called Brexit vote, in which Great Britain decided to leave the European Union. A huge blow to European unity, to say the least. It's not really clear yet what the uh, plan will be for the exit, and uh, certainly uh, the new Prime Minister, Ms. May, is taking her time with that because a good number of members of Parliament are still staggered by the whole dilemma. I've talked to many uh, scholars from Europe who suggest that depending upon how Britain decides to leave, there may be other countries in Europe now that want to have a referenda and uh, decide whether they want to stay in the situation. Uh, that would be very complex to say the least. Uh, on top of that, the United States uh, has had a treaty uh, before the Congress that deals with um, free trade and Europe in the same way that we've had a free trade agreement with the rest of, of Asia that in our judgment gave us a great deal of leadership uh, to uh, combat some of the difficulties that those countries are facing in their trade with China. But for the moment, uh, in our politics, neither of those treaties are moving. As a matter of fact, the sentiment is much as it is in many of the European populist situations. Uh, people who feel that uh, we would lose jobs, we would be undersold by currencies that fall, a whole raft of, of measures of this variety. I, I start, however, with Europe because this is still a pretty solid alliance. It depends upon our political will and the trust that countries have in us as well as in each other, but it does provide at least one portion of the world that is still relatively prosperous. Uh, still does respect human rights, the rights of women, uh, religious rights. These are important aspects, even with all the internal debates that may occur there. Now, while we have been preoccupied with Europe, 
The administration of President Obama also initiated what was known as the Pivot to Asia. Well, I was serving on the Foreign Relations Committee at the time that the pivot was mentioned, and it never was very clearly defined for us, but the net effect of this was to say that the United States fleet is the fleet that keeps all of the sea lanes all over the world open. That is, that world trade depends upon the movement of goods and services, not only through the Suez Canal and various other straits here and there and so forth, but everywhere. And the United States fleet is everywhere. It's the most powerful fleet in the world. And uh, although not much attention is paid to it, not nearly enough credit, it is critical to the whole idea of trade. Now the, the, the situation with regard to uh, of Asia was that uh, some countries felt that the Chinese were beginning to crowd into the South China Sea and occupy islands. Dramatically, they took over some islands in which there was no population and, and built uh, runways for aircraft or various other situations where their ships might dock. Uh, some of these were in the South China Sea, but some movement toward the, the Philippines and toward Indonesia. That was very scary to those populations. So as a result, the United States began to send a more aircraft carrier uh, around uh, the area. I remember in 2012 being in Manila and uh, seeing that the aircraft carrier from the United States was out in the harbor and went out to see Hoosiers who were aboard and what have you. But it made a great deal of difference at that point to the Philippines that that carrier had come to the harbor, that there were American seamen coming into Manila to visit. I mention that because just a few years before, Americans at Clark Air Force Base had seen that situation terminated as a military base. And likewise, there were other aspects in the Philippines that were unfortunate. Some might add tonight as a footnote, we don't know really what the new president of the Philippines will have in mind in terms of that cooperation. We're hopeful that uh, he will uh, come around to a situation in which uh, we have some practical talks about it, but that remains to be seen. In any event, the pivot to Asia meant that we took much more interest in the problems of our friends, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Australians. There are now Marines stationed in Australia. Uh, that had not been the case historically, quite apart from troops that still remain in the Philippines and many troops in Japan and even more in South Korea ever since the Korean War. Uh, now the, the Pacific situation uh, remains uh, fluid but uh, nevertheless promising largely because of American initiative and the confidence that people have really in our fleet and in trade in which they are able to move, the Chinese uh, being the largest movers of all of this trade, the greatest exporters really in the world at this particular point. I mention these geographical situations because they are filled with the problems I have already enumerated. But nevertheless, there is possibility for stability, really based upon confidence in the United States and American leadership and tactical ability. Now, when it comes to that which is in between, namely the Middle East, uh, that's a situation that, of course, has evolved very unfortunately over quite a period of time. We, we all are, were shocked by the attack on New York City and the Pentagon and the 9-11 attack and uh, realized that there were persons um, in the Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan who potentially were the responsible ones. And uh, before too long, we were involved in military conflict in Afghanistan. Uh, we still are, uh, despite uh, a good number of ideas that we will withdraw troops, and we have withdrawn some from time to time. Then we have replaced them. We've tried to train the uh, uh, people to fight the Taliban, tribes in the uh, eastern part of the country, that often uh, find some harbor in parts of Pakistan. Pakistanis don't like them either. Uh, it's just that this is sort of a wild territory, not really carefully governed. 
Uh, I would just say simply that um, uh, the, the problems in Afghanistan continue and they grew when uh, we determined to overthrow the government of Iraq, a brutal dictator, and there were Americans at the time who said this is a good opportunity for us to have really a, a model flagship in the Middle East that respects democracy, develops them, first of all, through elections, through the development of political parties, that develops human rights, women's rights, all the rest. In other words, if Iraq, after the dictator fell, had a constructive regime which the United States helped to bring about, maybe other nations would find that that was desirable, would follow that example, uh, and we would not have the difficulties that seem to come from dictators and monarchs and what have you. Well, it didn't work out altogether well in Iraq. It was a long stretch. Uh, ultimately, there was a free and fair election. The uh, prime minister who was elected was not effective. And in fairness to him, there still remained in Iraq the problem that there are sharp divisions between Shiites, Sunnis, and Kurds, three very distinct groups of people who have not been very compatible with each other historically and are not now. The, uh, uh, the dictator in Iraq, because he did use armed might, kept the country unified. But uh, absent uh, that situation, uh, the democratically elected president of Iraq was unable really to bring a coalition that was satisfying even between the Sunnis and the Shiites, quite apart from the Kurds who still harbored thoughts of independence in the northern part of the country. And this, of course, then and subsequently has led to many Kurds in Turkey, known as the PKK, a real problem for President Erdogan who would like to be with the Kurds in Iraq. There are even some Kurds in Syria who would like to hook up, you know, all of this. Uh, but uh, obviously President Assad very opposed to any such thing of that variety. We are uh, in a position sometimes now in battles against ISIS in Iraq in which uh, we find the Kurds to be the most uh, reliable armed force for our people to deal with. Uh, quite apart from the Iraq government, as we hope that we are able to finally take back Iraq from ISIS forces that still occupy a large part of the country, quite apart from most of Syria. Um, we were excited in some ways when in the Middle East an Arab Spring occurred, starting with Tunisia. Uh, a powerful leader there was overthrown. Uh, Tunisia is one of the bright spots in that after several years, there is the beginning of a democracy that might begin to work in that country. But next door in Libya, where Muammar Gaddafi was the leader, uh, most Americans rejoiced that he was overthrown, but Americans have not realized that ever since Gaddafi left, there has been anarchy in Libya. There are tribes along the coast in various uh, sectors of the country, but totally incompatible with one another. Uh, we are still working on trying to find some degree of governance in Libya. It's one of these situations uh, which is difficult. I remember uh, as an assignment from the State Department, they asked me one time to go to Morocco, first of all, to uh, work with the president of, of Algeria uh, to um, free prisoners who were in, uh, they were Moroccans who had been taken in a, a, a battle with Algeria and Morocco. And I went down with uh, General Jones and uh, put on a cape and went to a meeting and uh, the prisoners were liberated and we flew over to Morocco. And, and there the king was very disturbed, didn't want to see us for a while, but decided after all, that uh, might as well talk to us. But while I was over there, I got word from the White House they wanted me to go to Libya, see what I could do over there. This is really improvisation. So I had an Air Force plane. We flew over to Libya, and nothing happened for 48 hours or so, but uh, Gaddafi heard that I was there and asked me to come out to the desert. And uh, we went out, uh, and uh, he was whiffing himself under a tent and so forth, as you may remember. 
and very rapidly decided he didn't, didn't want to stay in, in that tent and moved over to another tent. Now it turned out that tent was a small one and it was an air-conditioned van. <laughs> and uh, so we had our one-on-one -on -one each, with each other with translators. And Gaddafi was seriously worried about assassination by uh, some groups in Saudi Arabia. What an American aid. But secondly, he was even more worried about desalinization of seawater, which he felt was imperative for the continuation of life in Libya. A very interesting thing. I was able to bargain with him to gain freedom for some male nurses from Europe that had been captured and had been kept there, and likewise to begin some trade with Libya and the United States that uh, proceeded really for, uh, for a little while. Um, he was a dictator, but somehow or other, uh, Libya was producing oil, uh, was at least having an income and uh, some stability. After Gaddafi, uh, none of the above. These are the tough choices, always in world politics. Even as you uh, get what you wished for in the overthrow of dictators, uh, sometimes uh, you did not wish to have anarchy and general suffering. But in any event, Egypt overthrew Mubarak. We went through a Muslim Brotherhood period, then General Sisi now, who some feel is a dictator, although we try awfully hard not to say that too loud. He does have some qualities of governance that are helpful, uh, as opposed to the problems, obviously, in Syria uh, and, and even what is left over in Iraq. Now, on top of all of this, uh, we have a situation in which um, our own government has been ambiguous about the Syrian situation. You will recall way back uh, and when President Obama declared that if, in fact, uh, chemical weapons were used against the population, we would intervene. But uh, then made a judgment that we would not intervene. Um, ultimately, uh, chemical weapons have been taken out of Syria because the Russians decided that that would be a good idea. And we provided really the expertise to our DITRA, the Defense Threat Production Agency, that actually got the chemical weapons out of there, got them out to sea, destroyed them, and so forth. Um, but the, those degrees of cooperation have been uh, very few. Now there are some who suggest that the American Air Force ought to join the Russian Air Force in uh, bombing raids. Uh, but the idea is it would preserve the Assad government, albeit uh, occupying now a very small part of Syria. But the rest of Syria under control of so-called rebels or the so-called ISIS, Islamic State people. Now this is a, going to be a dilemma for the incoming president, as has been for the outgoing president. To what extent should the United States enter into this thing try to control this whole area. Uh, the thought was when we went into this in Iraq that we would control the whole area. We would try to bring about democracy, human rights, elected president. Uh, but uh, Iraq is uh, not much of a country right now. It's not really clear when all of ISIS might ever get out of there, even if they did how the Sunnis and the Kurds and the Shiites might react vis-a-vis -vis each other. In other words, um, as I hear people glibly saying, well, we've really got to get in there and take out ISIS. Even if we did so in Iraq and in Syria, we now see ISIS bobbing up in northern African states. Uh, and uh, we even see vestiges sometimes, we think, in Pakistan. Well, that's still a stretch and hard to tell what's happening in the western part of that country. Uh, I mention all of this because whoever is elected president is going to need to have a, a brilliant group around him, uh, Secretary of State and Defense and CIA and maybe other thinkers who are able to try to bring about a course for this United States that is compatible with the Congress as well as the American public. In the past, and I've already cited the European situations, the public as a whole really was not very eager to get into World War I. The public was not eager to get into World War II. It took certain circumstances that finally brought us to those particular junctures. It's not that we are an isolationist country. As a matter of fact, I've already described how worldwide 
our stretch is. But uh, there are Americans who say, you know, America needs to take leadership everywhere. It needs to be sort of a, an overall governing body. That is probably not doable and not acceptable to many people around the world. In any event, the Middle East remains a conundrum and it will remain that way, I suspect, uh, for a while, although exhaustion may occur in terms of some of the parties and, and there may be at least pleas for some type of American assistance that uh, comes about. Uh, I have no prediction of, on those grounds. I would say that um, leaving aside the geographical problems of the world, and I've already touched upon these in terms of our own politics, there are these overall problems of trade, the overall problem of immigration, the people movement. Uh, these are questions that we will have to wrestle with as Americans that are very important for our future in terms of our economy as well as our leadership abroad and in terms really of justice for human beings. Um, my own view is that we need to pass very constructive immigration legislation that really begins to define what a route to citizenship might be for a great number of people who have been in this country for quite a while and are constructive citizens. A very specific thought might be given uh, to the young people who uh, came, or even some who were born in the United States, uh, with parents who are not citizens, and uh, how we keep those families together, uh, how we keep the young people, who are many of them in our schools and colleges now, doing constructive work on course. In other words, as opposed to discussing about building a wall or, or kicking uh, 50, a million, 15 million, or whatever people think are here, uh, begin to think through literally a system of law, a system of regulation that uh, might bring some order out of chaos in that particular issue. My prejudices on the trade issue will come down to the fact that I believe that we are the most competitive nation in the world. But in a free and fair trade environment, uh, we are going to be a winner more often than a loser. The dilemma of that advocacy is very clearly that in some particular industries, uh, we might be the loser. And if you happen to be a citizen uh, that is in one of the losing industries, you're going to be very unhappy about that. And demand, as a matter of fact, that whatever it is, be kept out. Um, and we're going to go through a lot of that. But at the same time, uh, I know from uh, my own experiences, I told the students this evening, when I came back from the Navy and found the Thomas O. Green Company on the west side, which my grandfather Thomas O. Green had founded, making baking machinery for the cookie and cracker industry. And uh, he passed away a long time uh, before that. My dad had passed away while I was uh, in the Navy. My brother Tom, fortunately, had a Purdue engineering degree, which was very helpful in terms of modernizing our equipment. But it was left to me to figure out some overall strategy for the salvation of the company. Um, I went to see Senator Homer Capehart of Indiana at the time. He, had an, uh, inter he gave me an interview with the Export-Import Bank, and they uh, signed up on a conditional sales contract that we had with a Mexican firm to sell a lot of machinery. It was a great order, and we then sold more machinery to Mexico, and then to Venezuela and Brazil and Latin American countries, and then even to the Philippines. Our 50 employees became 100 employees. The President Kennedy awarded our factory the EAP Award for Export Excellence, the first firm in central Indiana of any size to be recognized for that, and Matt Welch, our governor, came out to help me raise the flag uh, in front of the factory. So I, as I say, I have a prejudice toward this sort of thing because uh, we became competitive. We began really to create jobs. We created a new firm that made a big difference for quite a while on the west side of Indianapolis. That's happening all over Indiana. It's happening all over America because we do have very talented people and we do have people very versed in trade throughout the world. But this is going to be a dilemma for the new president, for the Congress, for the public for some time. 
Uh, but it's a very important situation to resolve in terms of America's place in the world. Now, leaving aside uh, economic problems just for a second, uh, one of the dilemmas that uh, we have that's arisen in everybody's mind very, very sharply is uh, now cybersecurity. Uh, this is different from the problem of nuclear weapons or, or the free trade issue or so forth. Cybersecurity uh, brings to mind, and I'm not an expert in the whole aspect of it, that uh, somehow or other people in other countries can either read our mail, jam our mail, uh, change the messages, uh, change the news, so-called fake news. In other words, uh, in the past, perhaps we were reliant, as, as journalists I talked to this week said, on the fact that, say, if you were at the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, as these two journalists were, you had to be careful what you wrote because uh, you might be sued if you wrote uh, falsity, you might be sued for libel. You had uh, lawyers in your paper who defended the paper. Um, and so you might have to issue an apology and a retraction and so forth. But what if you come on to sort of a worldwide Facebook and you just simply publish all sorts of things? Um, there's, there's no retraction there, it's just out there. And uh, you can spread the word if it's very sensational. It may get quite a play, as a matter of fact. Now, that's the affirmative side. On the negative side, uh, what if, as a matter of fact, people are able, through uh, cyber warfare, to gum up the works so that our banking system in a city fails or shuts down? Or not just one city, maybe a, an area. Or our hospitals, likewise, are, are shut down and communication is lost. Or all sorts of suffering is created in this way by sources that we really don't know where they are. Um, this is a different kind of world. We've been discussing a world in which you can think of armed forces, people who are organized uh, to shoot at each other or to use uh, aircraft or submarines or so forth. But what, what if it's not a violent situation of that variety, but rather one of information or, or privacy or, or your own bank account wiped out for some reason by somebody that you could not have anticipated. Now these are our areas we're going to have to get into very much more substantially. I'm sure we will uh, through various industries and uh, various aspects of government, but we're still on the sort of the periphery of it. And I, I, would, I would say, in addition, that although we have had some success in the so-called non lucrative Cooperative Threat Reduction Act in getting rid of the 7,800 to 8,000 warheads in Russia that were aimed at us, and I, I do want to make the point again that during one time when I was in Siberia and we were taking out a large missile that had 10 warheads on it, uh, they would have gone to 10 different destinations. And I went down into the tube and there was a desk down there where the guards were uh, stationed. Um, and around the table were pictures, beautiful pictures of American cities. Ostensibly, these were the targets. Well, I was shocked, you know, having served as mayor of Indianapolis for eight years, I had no idea that someday an accident might occur, I suppose. And we will be obliterated. This whole place wiped out. And that was very possible during a 40-year period of so-called mutually assured destruction. But uh, nevertheless, uh, thank goodness that did not occur. Uh, but uh, at the time that uh, we were going down into the tubes, we, we really realized the difficulties that uh, we had had in the past and we could still have. The last uh, treaty we had was the New START Treaty. It was passed in 2012 before I left the Senate. And I worked with Senator John Kerry, who was then chairman of the committee, and I was the ranking Republican member. Uh, there has not been any movement subsequently on the part of our government or the Russians to reduce the number of nuclear weapons. As a matter of fact, some of the debate in our own Congress is that we ought to refurbish the stock of the weapons we have. 
and um, they might be getting old and we want to make sure we can shoot them. And the Russians often claim that we're doing the same sort of thing. Now, that, that's the more dramatic aspect of it. The less dramatic, but perhaps potentially most dangerous for the time being, is that uh, in the course of all of this nuclear business, or chemical weapons, or even some biological weapons, uh, some of the materials got spread to other countries. The Nuclear Threat Initiative Board, which Sam Nunn heads, and I've served on his board now since the beginning of that uh, situation, published uh, a book that shows that there are 25 countries that have uh, nuclear material, or, or have at least elements that might be utilized for biological or chemical warfare. Uh, four or five countries have, uh, have given up all of their materials and given them back to the United States or to Russia. Uh, but we still have some distance to go. Now, these are not countries that are getting ready to, to build nuclear weapons and fire at us, but these are materials that terrorists could scoop up and uh, create an incident in an American city or a European city or anywhere else for that matter. Uh, this is dangerous material that's out there that's been by and large rather overlooked, even as we're looking dramatically at the weapons. So I throw that before us tonight. In terms of America's place in the world, we've got to try to help organize this cleanup of what occurred during the developments, especially in the former Soviet Union and ourselves, uh, and uh, an attempt to bring at least some order out of chaos in those situations. Uh, finally, I would just say that um, I believe that we have, as I have stated earlier, the greatest fleet in the world. Um, it, is, it is not without its difficulties, and it will need to be refurbished. And all the things I'm talking about tonight cost money. We're going to have a period in American life in which we have to make some very tough choices. Uh, for, for many Americans, they would say, well, the first choice ought to be the refurbishing of our streets and roads and bridges and at least sort of the basic infrastructure of our country. It should happen locally, statewide, nationally. Other countries in Europe and elsewhere are thinking the same sorts of things as these facilities wear out. And uh, I, I certainly am in favor of moving ahead in those areas, as most of us would be. Um, most of us are likewise trying to think of what can our federal government do, and other governments are thinking the same thing, to help in job creation. If in fact there is a large block of population in our country that is very angry and very dissatisfied with the prospects for jobs, or the prospects for the education needed to get the jobs, or, or for a whole lot of things, uh, that isn't going to go away automatically, and we are going to have to try to think together in private industry and working with government, local, state, federal, uh, as to how we begin to offer some confidence to a large part of our population that is alienated. And so that's going to be uh, an expensive process in some cases, uh, public money, in many cases private money, which hopefully we will all make enough of in businesses to be able uh, to have these new investments, the new payments that are involved. We'll have to give some thought to the whole problem of jobs going overseas, money going overseas. Uh, this is going to be a big argument in terms of people in a private enterprise uh, situation. They would say, after all, if I can produce cars in China much less than uh, the cost in America, why shouldn't I build with my own capital here in America uh, plants in China to build cars or to build whatever it is that uh, might have uh, over there? Well, a lot of that has already occurred. It's not a new idea. And then furthermore, uh, they would say, now why do I have to bring the profits from all of that back to the United States? and pay corporation taxes. If I just leave it over there in the bank, nobody will pay attention to it. And I have some more capital that I could uh, apply in China or India or anywhere else for that matter. Very complex problem in terms of our own uh, economic philosophy as to what um, uh, freedom means in an economic sense. 
And, and finally, I would just say that um, we're going to have to try to think through how we balance the budget or how we even begin to, to reduce our federal debt. America's place in the world right now is in great uh, strengthened by the fact that um, other countries are buying our bonds. The, the Chinese are buying billions of dollars of our U.S. federal bonds. Um, this is one reason why we've been able, through the Federal Reserve Board, to keep interest rates close to zero or very, very low. The Chinese are not unique in that respect. Other countries have felt that uh, keeping capital in America is the safest thing they could do, as opposed to intrusions by some of their citizens or political strife within their countries, um, which is an unusual situation on the other side of our having money lodged in China, for example. But uh, in any event, most of the ideas being proposed by Republicans and Democrats uh, cost a lot of money. There, there is not any plan that I have seen thus far that makes a serious uh, attempt to reduce the federal debt that we now have. We believe, in fact, that probably interest rates are going to go up, if not in December, at the Federal Reserve Board in due course. Uh, it's an extraordinary time in which some banks in Europe have, have negative interest rates. Uh, ours are not negative, but uh, very close to that point, as a matter of fact. But um, I, I throw that one out because all of the things we're talking about require a payment, require good business management of government. Uh, we, are, we applaud, at least in this state, uh, our people for doing a pretty good job in cities and counties and, and with the state legislature and what have you, in my judgment and in paying our bills and in uh, managing to move ahead. Uh, but other states have not been uh, so fortunate and the federal government is completely off the charts in, in terms of the additional dollars in debt each year that we are incurring. I have no prediction as to what the edge is, at what specific point you reach a point of fis uh, fiscal chaos. But I would say that um, and this is not simply because of my age or the age of many in uh, the room tonight, that uh, the future of Social Security, the future of Medicare, what have you, is very much dependent uh, upon our ability, really, to come to grips with this overall deficit situation. Uh, we take uh, these payments and this security for granted. But in, from time to time, people write about how the Social Security Reserve will run out in a year or whatever it is, or Medicare likewise. And um, at least far enough out, we know it's not going to bother us in the next month or year. Um, we've got to begin thinking about our future and the future of our children and our offspring. So this is a heavy weight to throw out about America's role in the world or America's role in America. But uh, I cannot think of a group the more thoughtful people who have given time and leadership in this community and in this country than the group that's here tonight to think about these things. And this is why I have the audacity to have this agenda and to do these topics. And I appreciate so very much your listening without protest, without walkout. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Luger. I think that last uh, allusion was the one time when he gave a speech and we had Occupy um, Wall Street in the audience and they started protesting. Um, and that was, uh, some of you might remember that one. That was, that was an interesting event. Um, we, have, uh, we have some time for some questions. Um, and uh, for those of you who have not been here before, in front of every seat is a microphone. And if you push the button that says push and hold it down and speak into the microphone, everybody can hear you. We are filming the event. Um, all of our Global Studies events are posted on YouTube. And so we're filming it, so we'd like to be able to catch your, your questions as well as the answers. Um, and then I guess uh, we'll just uh, start calling some questions. And then after a few minutes of questions, we'll go out into the, uh, into the uh, lobby for a reception. 
Um, and there might be some media there too as well that want to ask you some questions. We have, we have refreshments and stuff in, in the uh, reception. Um, any any uh, first question? Um, sir on the stripes. Push down and hold it. Hold it while you're talking. Senator Luger. Yeah. There you go. Um, yes, sir. My, my question comes in two parts. Uh, to what extent do you feel the United States is responsible for the current chaotic situation in Syria and in the Middle East? And number two, to what extent do you feel we have a moral responsibility to assist in resolving the resultant refugee crisis? With regard to Syria, I do not believe we have uh, much of the responsibility for that particular situation. I, I say that because uh, essentially the Syrian crisis began uh, given the dictatorship, the authoritarian rule of President Assad. And President Assad is a part of a religious group uh, as opposed to most Syrians who are not a part of his religion. Uh, I would say that um, he had ruled successfully because he did have armed forces uh, behind him and they uh, minded uh, his business. Now, in the case of the Arab Spring that I've suggested, and it might have occurred without that, but given the sweep of this ideal throughout Northern Africa and the Middle East, of the overthrow of dictators and governments, uh, people in Syria who felt oppressed by Assad decided that it was time that Assad must go. And therefore, uh, they began attacks and uh, were repelled. And this has gone on for quite a while. <clears throat> Other countries, however, began to enter into this. There was a very strong, powerful rivalry, which I did not discuss tonight, between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, Iran with the, uh, the Shiites and the Saudis with the Sunnis. And, and, and by and large, they got involved then in backing forces in Iraq. People came over from Lebanon and became involved in the, in the war. And of course, now in recent times, uh, Vladimir Putin and the Russians have entered into this. And Putin has used this in Russia to indicate that Russia is still a powerful nation, still somebody you've got to pay attention to. Um, so you, you have all of these situations in which uh, the United States is only marginally involved in an attempt to give some training to the so-called rebels who are of many different uh, religious beliefs in Syria and who really have not responded very well to our training. It's been rather spasmodic, to say the least. We had hoped that the Saudis might help us in the training, but they've not really been very helpful. Uh, and so this is why the chaos continues without any particular resolution. Um, now, what was the second part of your, your question? I'm, I can't remember. It was about the uh, Syrian refugees and whether the U.S. should take, take them in or do we have an obligation? Yes, yes. Well, the United States um, did the state that we would take in a certain number. It's a fairly small number. And um, some states have said, well, they're not going to come here. And you have all sorts of situations of that variety going on. Um, so in the United States is not much of a player in this respect. As I say, Angela Merkel um, was the big uh, and generous player and took in a lot of people. But that's been resented in Germany. The people coming into France have probably driven France from a more moderate government to something else and we don't know the final resolution. We know the current president of France is not going to run for re-election. Somebody else is going to come along. Um, great resistance, obviously, in Greece and Turkey, because this is where some of the refugees finally, or first of all, land before they work their way up somewhere else. I don't know what the end of all of that is going to be. We're not out of the woods with regard to Syrian refugees. And um, my, my guess is that uh, there will be more and more resistance, more fights over the situation. But uh, there is nobody in charge to say, well, you've got to go here, there, or yon, or stay, or so forth. This is in chaos. Yes, yes, sir. 
Thank you, Senator Luger. Uh, you've got a couple of returned Peace Corps volunteers here from Central America. Uh, given that, I would be curious what you see the future of our role in Central, uh, excuse me, in Central America being, uh, particularly given the increasing instability and uh, rapidly rising populations in those areas. Not much attention has been paid publicly to Central America recently. Uh, and that I regret, but the fact is that uh, our attention has been diverted in so many other different ways. Uh, Central America frequently comes into our purview only if uh, drug dealers or somebody uh, uh, who is uh, desperate in that variety works his or her way down through Mexico and across the border. And many have been doing so. At the same time, um, and I'm not uh, off the top of the head able to cite the conditions in each of the Central American countries, but uh, there has been some general stability in several, and uh, that has been helpful to those in which there is less stability. In other words, uh, the cooperation has been beneficial. But uh, it's a situation in which, uh, because of the drug dealing, most of our uh, newsworthy attention in Central America has been to prevent and stop that, which would be as a threat uh, to our country, uh, as opposed to thinking through uh, investment in those countries. We are attempting in universities in this state, as well as all over our country, uh, to bring about more exchange of young people in colleges and education, and that's very helpful because some of the leaders in the future may come from uh, American education and, and have some friends here and uh, some confidence in, in how they can employ our leadership or our resources. Likewise, Americans who go to those countries will come back, as you have, with some sensitivity about the problems and become advocates, really, for more attention to be paid. Hello, thank you for uh, coming tonight. Uh, we're in agreement that free trade is an overall um, <clears throat> is overall beneficial to our society, but how do we help those who are temporarily disenfranchised by the effects of it? What, what do you say about those folks? Uh, so how do we help the, the people who may be tempor temporarily disenfranchised by the effects of trade deals, even though they are helpful in the long term, so those who may lose their jobs at, uh, in Detroit or other places? I believe that... Um our governments, whether they are at the uh, state and local level or, or the national, really have to be cognizant of particular industries in uh, their purview uh, and understand that um, what is occurring is not going to go away for a while, that there, there will need to be programs, particularly of education. I come back to the thought that um, if we, the educational level of persons who are being dispossessed or who are losing their jobs increases to the point they are able to gain more sophisticated, better paying jobs, this is our best solution. Now you can say, well, that may work with somebody who is 25 years of age or maybe 35 or so, but what about those who are, uh, say, 55, 60, 65, and uh, who really had counted upon retirement or, or some other life other than going back to college or uh, some type of school and so forth. That's not a part of them. Who I just simply say, well, we need relief. We need welfare. We need something. Um, and this is going to be an ongoing dilemma. I don't think there is any solid answer to this. We can, we can talk and, and we should about education and preparation, about uh, attracting new businesses to come to our cities and counties in Indiana, for example. Uh, and uh, our, our officials are doing that and doing a pretty good job, I believe, in many parts of the state. Uh, there, there have to be some replacements of this Friday. Now, I, I didn't want to get in, because this uh, is a big issue all by itself tonight, to the climate change argument. Uh, in Indiana, this has some impact with regard to coal industry, much more so in Kentucky, West Virginia, other places. Uh, if you take the position that there really is no man-made climate change, 
and that all of this is a hocus pocus about the need to stop using coal or other uh, uh, fuels that may create CO2, then you just find the winding up of the coal thing to be intolerable. But uh, if, in fact, uh, as is the case around the world, most countries, even including China, one of the biggest coal producers and users, now understand that um, it may not be next year, maybe 10 years, 15 years from now, that uh, the pollution that's evident in all the cities of China becomes uh, really a, a point where you really can't go outside. Or, in, in the case of uh, even in our country, uh, on the eastern or western coast, the waters rise to the point that people who used to love to live close to the sea, or, or even those who have rivers that come in, are going to see their houses washed away, and they won't be able to live there. Um, but that's 10 or 15 years down the trail. And your question really pertains right now for those in public life, what about the next year, about the next few months? And uh, I, I know other uh, avenues other than finding new jobs and training people for the jobs or for uh, jobs that are already there that they're not qualified for. Senator. Thank you. Uh, as you were talking about this global situation, in my own mind, I thought about the microcosm just 90 miles away, we like to say, that exists in Cuba. So with foreign trade, with dictatorship of sorts, with communist connections and so on, all of those things, and Fidel Castro having passed away, and, and the leadership in Cuba, Raul and others, being of the revolutionary age, quite advanced, and with a new administration coming in in the United States of America. Do you have any thoughts about the United States relationship with Cuba in the near or further future. My own view uh, is that the uh, beginnings that have occurred during the Obama administration should continue. I, I've applauded uh, the Indiana Farm Bureau people that went to Cuba uh, at the grassroots and began to try to think through with Cubans' agricultural situations. They're not unique in this respect. Other groups have attempted to do this that have not been well publicized. I think that the new flights that are flying to Cuba and back and forth are a good idea. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, Raul Castro and those around him are going to change their minds necessarily very fast, but uh, they're aging. There's a group of people, hopefully, in Cuba that are younger. Uh, and, then, and uh, my, my guess is that if we have really quite an influx of American influence, not only from tourists, but from farmers, from business people, from others, that we have a, a reasonable chance, really, of finding some folks in the population of Cuba who really like the idea of a closer affiliation and a different philosophy of politics or life than they have been subjected to. Uh, and this is a controversial area because some would say we shouldn't deal while well, Raul is still there. Still a communist regime and uh, we're kidding ourselves. And they might be right. I don't know really uh, how the progression may go. But I, I like the idea of a more active uh, agenda, a uh, presence which does not accept at least the situation that is there currently. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, yes. Thank you for your very, very thoughtful summary of the current situation. I have a couple of thoughts about some of the points made and some of the things prevailing in our country. One of which is, 50 years ago, I sat as a student in a classroom like this one, and I learned about capitalism something that I had never thought about. Which is, it is not designed to have full employment, never could be. Therefore, that seems to be widely unknown about the general public. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm one of the 4%, but it means that somebody is. And the other is, um, when the current chancellor at IUPUI came into office, he did some presentations. And his presentation showed the future, which was uh, 
and image on the screen of huge amounts of machinery. And so it seems to me in this current election season, there's, there's general lack of awareness that it's perhaps not even the majority reason for unemployment being immigrants, but rather the ongoing growth in this country of ways to advance our economy, which does not mean well, I came here with a cab driver knife that worked four years for Chrysler. Um, he doesn't need, perhaps, to be driving cab, but he's getting a, a reduced uh, pension in retirement now. And so I just mentioned that, that he wasn't complaining. He said, I think we should all work. But the reality is things have changed in terms of automation and manufacturing. Thank you. Well, you make a, a very good point that uh, at the very time that the all right the the question is uh, what do we say about the fact that uh, new machinery in America new ways of producing products are occurring everywhere as the firms are competitive and uh, therefore uh, maybe if you uh, employ some of this new equipment you may need only half as many workers to operate it. Uh, so, uh, how do you how do you solve unemployment at the same time that uh, you're progressing competitively in a capitalistic system with uh, new equipment, new ways of doing things? And uh, of course, we touched upon this a little bit by saying that well, one way you do it is to to try to get educational resources available for people who now are unemployed so that they can understand how to use the new machinery or to use somebody else's machinery. In other words, they're displaced from the particular job they have and not necessarily from the whole field if they become more sophisticated. Um, but that takes some doing. And as I suggested earlier on, maybe easier to do at an earlier age uh, then at a later time, uh, closer to retirement. Uh, I, I think that in our state we've seen a, a great deal of change just in the last 20 years in, in terms of the steel industry and the auto industry. Now this doesn't specifically go to your question of machinery and what have you, but it, it does in the sense that people have been producing steel and autos now all over the world, sometimes more efficiently than we were with our own facilities here. They're less competitive. They don't make the same return on capital that we had in the past. Now, the other fact is that we have to think of is maybe not all of us will ever uh, be utilizing machinery. Maybe those of us in the health services industry or those in education or those who are lawyers or, or a good number of things. Uh, th th and these are professions that also are required. Maybe there'll be more demand for certain types of these professions. And uh, therefore, uh, we have to constantly be ingenious enough to think through in a competitive society, really how we can do things better and maybe create new jobs that uh, no one thought of a time before. Uh, but the transition from one to the other is tough. And it doesn't occur overnight, and it will require a lot of thoughtful planning and some explanation by our political leaders to offer reassurance to the public that that kind of thought is occurring. Uh, do you have time for one more question, do you think? Sure. One more. How about a question from a student? <laughs> Back there, I see a hand up. <laughs> Senator Luger, what is your opinion on a possibility of America stepping back almost its military control across the globe, uh, reaching more towards a NATO, UN-backed uh, force in countries such as Japan, North Korea, South Korea, and maybe even the North China Sea? What would you see a more UN approach? Could you see that happening, or would you rather have American troops in those positions? I would not necessarily rather have American troops there, but as a practical matter, I do not foresee that without um, very strong American leadership and financing in many cases, that uh, the United Nations forces will be adequate 
to meet the challenges that you've uh, enumerated and that I've been talking about earlier on. In other words, uh, I believe America's role in the world is still going to be the leader that we are going to have to really produce organization and frequently money and people uh, to back whatever might occur with NATO or the United Nations or CETO or any other treaty situation that we have. At the same time, we clearly will want to encourage others to do more. I, I don't want to create a, a further problem by illustrating this, but for instance, uh, a president like Trump in, in one of his speeches said about NATO that uh, some of these countries are not paying their way. Well, he's, he's right. Uh, ultimately, NATO uh, said you ought to give 2% of your gross national product to uh, back up at least the force of NATO and keep the whole thing whole. Only about half a dozen or seven or eight of the NATO countries uh, have reached that particular or stayed even close to that. So uh, President Trump probably expressed the feelings of many Americans who said it's all right for the Latvians <laughs> And, uh, and the others to worry about Russia, but they're not paying their way. Why should the United States worry about Article 5? He didn't mention Article 5, but that is the, the basic article they worry about. It says we must go there. Um, well, for the time being, the United States holds NATO together with that assurance that we would go there. And that's the reason the Russians have not taken uh, parts of it like Ukraine or Crimea or two provinces in Georgia or so forth. Uh, and it just illustrates again the necessity of, uh, of American boots on the ground to some extent, but American organization uh, as really the essential. Okay, um, we're going to end here, but we have a reception outside uh, in the lobby um, with some re uh, refreshments, and uh, you could uh, talk to Senator Luger for a, for a minute if you'd like. We can carry on the conversation. Thank you all for coming, and uh, drive safely.